Hi everybody and welcome back to the Bear Trap Discord podcast. My name is John Kirby, my co-host is Vic. All chart credits as always go to Auk. This is the second part of episode 9 and this is where we made our projections for the week to come, which is now the week in retrospective. But that might prove useful for you guys anyway, because you can look and see which parts of our analysis were useful, which parts weren't, uh, what was on the ball and what wasn't, and then it'll also give you an idea of what to look for for this next monthly OPEX cycle. Um, I'm still thinking about a lot of the things that we were discussing in the podcast, so hopefully uh, all of you guys will too. In any case, like, subscribe, uh, enjoy, etc. Uh, see you in the podcast. Okay, so this right here, open interest, this is coming up for... Um... Like the main thing that stands out to me, I always check this first thing as soon as it's updated. And I always go to the biggest expiry, like which is the biggest expiry. Right now we have uh, February 17th, I would say. Um, I would well, say, actually, actually, I would say January 20th. 20th. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of, it depends on the strike. But um, yeah. Yeah. So, OK, so first things I note are like the what is the biggest strike? Okay, uh, overall, because you're looking at 50 DT here, uh, biggest oh, yeah. strike, and then what is the biggest expiry? So biggest strike here is going to be this 370 uh, on a whole, and then the biggest expiry is going to be Friday coming up. Yeah. And then, so now what is the majority of folks, what is the majority of positioning right now? I mean, just looking down the, just looking at it from a naive perspective, because we don't really know what the positioning actually is but we can make a pretty safe assumption that it's probably bearish um, just based on put call ratio, you know, where all the open interest is. Uh, it's pretty safe to assume that people are positioned bearish. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think it's kind of funny, like when you, um, like a lot of the January 20th, uh, there, there are way more calls in January 20th. If you go out to February, you can see that it's all puts more or less. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's more calls right now. Um, as the market's been moving up, people are obviously going to be, they're going to start positioning because um, that's kind of new, I, I would say, the positioning into the calls. Um, but it could be sold calls, though, you know, you never really know what those are, right? Unless we look at, you know, the GAX and the DEX, right? So those are going to give you a little bit more of a, a clarity there. Um, yeah, I mean the the thing that I that I look at, um, and I, I I hope that the SKU podcast kind of made this a little clearer. But if I want to know, hey, are those sells or buys primarily, then I do look at the SKU, right? Because the, the SKU will tell me um, where the risk is, which is essentially the same thing. Yep, right. So let's look at this next chart, the Gex one. So we're look, right. I always look at the just kind of the raw open interest, and then uh, look at the Gex. Yeah, because it's like the Greeks are kind of like filters on the open interest. So it makes a lot of sense to start with the open interest and then look at the various ways you that can, it can be interpreted. You, dude, I did a 13-minute video just on this open interest uh, chart. So you can make a, you can already make a ton of assumptions and a trade plan and everything without looking at anything else. I agree. The naive open net open interest. But uh, we want to get a little bit more clarity, get a little bit more rounded in our analysis. So, yeah, let's look at the GEX. All right. Next. Um, all right. So, you know, this is going to be, again, 50 DTE, uh, our, you know, our main expiries. And so the reason I care about this main expiry is why? Why do I care about that one? Well, it has the most, it has the most gamma. It has the most gamma and it's going to be doing what? Driving most of the flows, right? Yeah. And as we get closer to that day, uh, and we're monitoring it every day and seeing the position changing, we'll have a really, really good sense. And it'll just become intuitive after a while, a really good sense of, you know, who's off sides. And this is what we care about. You know, we care about, you know, who's off sides or who's driving the market into an, you know, a certain direction. And in this case, I think a lot of what's happening into, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but a lot of what's happening into Friday is just going to be, uh, as the market tries to go down, it's just going to be short covering, put puts closing. Yeah, because uh, uh, there's just a lot of supply. People people have so and, and this is where uh, watching that new indicator that I was working on, basically it's tracking put calls and sells. And so this 
basically just showed me, it's like, man, if you come into a day or you've just got an oversupply of people just sitting in puts or calls, you know, that's where you're going to get those, that's where you get those moves. It's just those people just having to get out of them. Yeah. Right? So right now we've got just an oversupply, especially compared to calls. Well, and this uh, is, but, this is a, you know, a little bit of a tangent, but so spot gamma, when they came up with their vol trigger and we, you know, we have vol triggers on our charts as well. The idea was, okay, under, under the vol trigger, then all of a sudden market makers are going to move. They're going to move with uh, the volatility, right? So they're going to lean into expansions, lean into moves, and then above mm -hmm. they're going to be suppressive of vol. Um, and that's sort of a very rudimentary way to look at this because oh, like, sure. I mean, I mean, like, like you were just saying, Hey, if we're entering into a day, like, let's say we're under the total vol trigger but we're entering into a day in which we're under that days of all trigger, but there's a ton of puts underneath us. And the biggest puts are underneath, you know, the biggest uh, gamma uh, strikes on the puts are underneath some lower gamma strikes on the puts. Well, as we go down, clearly those people are gonna start to sell. So if you, you have to think about like the open interest and the gamma in terms of like the incentives of various market players, not just the market makers, right? Right. And that's going to tell you if we're going to be stifling or expanding volatility in a much more accurate way than just well, under about, yeah under that yeah. vol trigger the the general idea is that the market makers the dealers are just going with the market so if it's being if, it, if the market's weak they're selling into weakness if it's strong they're buying into strength and then vice versa above it where they're selling strength and buying weakness which is going to suppress volatility so that's why they say the, the volatility expands under the trigger and gets suppressed above it um, but like you said, it's rudimentary because if you don't understand the positioning, then you're going to be caught off size a lot of times because um, it's not that simple. If it was that simple where you just had a single line on a chart and you just knew it was a sell underneath. and a buy Yeah, every, everybody would be making mean reversion trades above yeah. the vol trigger and everybody yeah. would be making I say expansion this, trades underneath. I say the vol trigger is more like a magnet itself in most cases. And... Uh, the market is essentially trying to f trying to find a reason to get back to it. Yeah, and I mean the reason the reason for that, and this will go directly back to the positioning, is that okay? Let's say you're holding out of the monies. At some point, you're more likely to sell those out of the monies than not. When you sell the out of the monies, uh, it by default pushes us back into the vol trigger, which is by default between the out of the monies. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. So if you understand. The edges, kind of like what you've been playing, is the boundaries. If you know where the boundaries are as far as options positioning goes, that's where you can start understanding how time is going to be affected and how volatility is going to affect those positions. And uh, and then you can start visualizing how the delta contracts around a certain level. So, like in this case, uh, the you know the delta is most likely going to start contracting around the 400 level it's pretty plain yeah and uh, this is for the next 50 uh, this is just for the next week and so what is it what happens to all these positions if, if the market closes here at the end of the week around 400 you know everything expires worthless right yeah for the most part and then yeah, they could even I, I, I they could even close say... this at 399.50 and all those 400s are dead too yeah, the only thing is that we do have right like this positioning is going to shift pretty radically this week because of the because of the VIXX and the OPEX. Right, that is this week still, right? Because it's the 16th. Yeah. And then so, the 20th is Friday. So that's another thing too is is uh keeping that in mind. Um the VIX. Right? We got we have to know where the VIX is is trying to what the VIX is trying to do. And so let's pull up a VIX uh GEX chart. If we can grab one of those, yeah, because that's a that's dude that for me has been so key. I don't care if anybody says don't gex the VIX, and I've said this a million times. I don't care how many times you say that. I I look at that VIX gex every day, and that thing is accurate to the freaking penny, man. Like this thing is so accurate, um, and understanding understanding the positioning in the VIX. Uh, is so key to knowing what's going to happen in in spy options or SPX well, and options. Well, this is this is something that I've been wondering about um, because I I agree 100%. And like this is what I like. In addition to the skew, this is what I'm relying at 
on, sorry, to give me that sort of like my, I call it like the seasonality of volatility. Mm -hmm. um, it just has these natural cycles. And, and that's one of the things that sort of like the market timing things that I love the most. What is amazing to me, though, is that when I think about it in terms of notional value, it's not it's not that high up there. You know what I mean? Like, what are you like? I mean, and this we don't see it directly here because this isn't net open interest or anything like that. But I mean, these are pretty like it's like 20 and then we're looking at a 75 million. If you compare that to the ge gex that you get on a spy in a day, it's way more. It's just that for whatever reason, it seems like what is this like professional positioning or something like that? Um, I would say what I, what I really want to know about what's happening in the VIX is, is there because the, the key that I've learned from Jim is, is there a supply or is there demand? Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of what I read off it. You know, you don't look at it like a normal Gex, like on a spy. But what it's telling me is that, you know, positioning in the VIX right now is, you know, people are just overloaded with hedge, hedges. Um, and they're starting to position to the upside. You can start seeing that. Uh, and those positions are going into uh, February and March. Yeah. Um, which, again, they're hedging again, uh, which they should. But in the in the short term, what we're looking at is at least into Wednesday, when all this gex expires, we're we're looking at basically some more volatility suppression. And even if it goes away, which it, it will, uh, you may get some sell coming in. Uh, but you again, you just look at the next expiry for VIX and go, okay, here's where the here's what the demand or supply looks like for puts. And then you can start making some assumptions and inferences on those open interest positions based on what volatility is going to do at least. Because the time part is easy, right? Because if you're looking at, at one or two days out, you've already got the time component <laughs> because all you got to do is wait for the end of the day or uh, you can already tell, you know, because the expiry is happening. But the volatility component is the other key is are the calls going to get squeezed? because of all, or are the puts going to get squeezed because of the all? So when you say that you see supply and demand off of the VIX net gex, how do you, um, what are you looking at? Well, okay, so just, uh, you know, my my thinking is, is like in this case, okay, there's just a ton of gamma here at this 19 yep. and, and 20. And, uh, you know, that basically just tells me that there's um, there's no there's no demand for hedging right now into the expiry nobody's nobody's adding to hedges nobody's buying puts and i think that's a, a function of everybody's already inputs and yeah. so they only have puts to sell they have only just, have puts just for to everybody close. to clarify the puts that 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 uh, vic is referring to are, are puts on spx and spy and so forth not yeah you have to know what the vix is actually calculating right so the vix is yeah. calculating uh essentially you look at it like it's looking at de demand for SPX options. Yep. Right. So I, I, I have this way of, of saying like it's kind of like an RSI of like a relative strength index of SPX options. And like if you're going to think of it like an RSI, I would say VIX is, is starting to hit those lower bounds of RSI. Like you're getting under 20 or whatever your number is. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I, OK, I, I see how you're how you're looking at this. Um, Good. OK. So and, I'm, and, I'm and, I don't, and I don't disagree with it. I would say that, like, obviously, it's not right. It's there's no direct connection, right? Because when we're looking at VIX net gex, we're looking at options on the VIX. Um, like the direct connection would be looking at the VIX index itself. But you know, they serve as a really, really good proxy for what you're trying to read. Anyway, I'm, I'm, yeah. what I'm trying to read is I want to see what the demand is for hedging in SPX into the next expiry. Right. Yeah, and, then, and there's and there's and there is definitely virtually none here, right? Because it's all on the put side in the VIX. Um, exactly. They so, all think that vol is going to be suppressed into the expiry. And then then the other thing to think about, right? And I'm sure I mean like we've talked about this before, right? As soon as all these guys go away, it almost acts as if all these things that are pushing volatility down have come off, and then it'll just release us to let us go back to the upside. Yeah. In volatility. Yeah, exactly. So right now you're you're uh, you're you're building the you know, you're pulling the rubber rubber band back. Yeah. You know, and you're 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 hit. You're getting to the end of where the rubber band is is almost stretched as far as it can go, and then you're going to get that release. And uh, you know, who knows? You probably will sell on Wednesday. 
Um, you'll probably be somewhere around that 410 spy or whatever. And then well, yeah, that, that goes into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is um, if we are going to get a serious sell, um, and this is what I was, sorry, let me get back on the, over here. Yeah, okay. So if we're going to get a serious sell, um, as we were looking at on the net OI, like we have actually right now, and this is concerning me a little bit, too many puts, because uh, I, I mean, I want us to sell off a bit, too many puts for February 17th on the on the books already. Um, but the other thing is how far away they are too. Um, so you could get a, a really nice sell from these upper levels. And, yeah. And you still, you know, you still cuck those, uh, you know, 370s and 380s. From but but the short paid. the short only comes off the squeeze. Like in order for that to be a viable short, um, we do need to squeeze up to 410, and we need the like the bullish flip to happen first. Then these guys need to kind of start to become a little less relevant, um, and then we can really get the sell off. Yeah, and so the key the keys for me at least looking forward uh, is um, obviously how, how does the how is price where is price going to go because. Uh, if we start heading lower and we start getting closer to those levels, uh, they could start acting as magnets. Uh, but right now they're repellents because they're so far away. And um, as we get closer to the expiries, as we get closer to Friday. So like my plan for this week was essentially be like, hey, we'll probably move up into 406, 410 by Wednesday uh, if we can get over 400. And e even if we just sat at 400 for the next couple of days, and then we'll probably get a nice little sell as the VIX releases and, yeah. and then you get probably, uh, you probably get a huge buy into the expiry um, as all those puts, uh, you know, basically realize their fate and that they're probably not going to get paid out without some, you know, two That's, or three I, I, like, I like that way of putting it as they realize their fate. Yeah. Um, and, and so they'll wake up on, on Thursday and uh, we, we may be at a low on Thursday, you know, we close at the lows and, but it's not low enough. And so you just wake up and just go, well, screw it. I'll just roll these hedges out or just close them all out, call it a day. Um, that's usually what ends up happening. And what I what I love about it is is a lot of times these moves were inexplicable to me. But now I have a, a, a way of at least framing them. No, I mean, and we, we see them, you know, uh, there's always going to be some uncertainty, but we see them brewing ahead of time substantially ahead yeah. of time right um, okay let's and, let's move on to the uh to the decks because this is something that we really wanted to get back into today i think yeah yeah for sure for sure okay so what what is this so we're looking at uh basically i man i've been trying to keep these uh dex charts to the simplest i could possibly do um and I'm really just looking at where the uh, where the positive delta is. Mm -hmm. I don't want to try to make I, I just make a super naive assumption, and uh, maybe someday when we get you know more you know data sources, we can start breaking this out into what the actual positioning is. But I just make a, a naive assumption as to where the delta is because if we hit that 390, just for example, um, what it, what does that mean for you know, anybody that's positive delta, essentially the market is net positive delta there. What would happen if price went below it? It means that all those positive hedges can come off, meaning that like we can start to really go down. That's like the inflection point of falling off of a cliff. Right. So what, what ends up happening is the reverse flows, you know, they start becoming negative, essentially. But but this also tells me, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but this also no, tells no, you're me fine. that so long as we stay above 390, um, we're actually okay. Like we can lose, we can come back down to the 395 region and that's not really cause for concern. And this is what tells me, like if I see positive gamma above and I see positive delta below, mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to be bearish. Um, you know, especially if I see a setup like this, like it, it really, you just need the three charts. You need the VIX, the GAX and the DEX. And you go, well, we're positive de uh, Delta, we're positive gamma and the VIX is negative gamma. Yep. So it's like, there's the, the three horsemen here of, of bullishness because uh, you know, you, you're fighting against all the flow. You got triple flow here. I love it. Yeah. 
So I use the deck simply as go, okay, where's my inflection point here? You can see the distribution of, of positive delta here. The inflection point is clearly uh, this 390. So as long as we're above the 390, we're in this positive delta environment. As long as the gex is on my side, it's positive gex, then, and it would have to be significantly negative gex to get us down there, I would think, because there's quite a bit of positive delta in between where we are now. And you can sort of see, like if you just look at it at a distribution, you can sort of see there's been no tail on the delta distribution. You know, we're kind of like a creating one, but to the upside, it would be weird to just stop here without feeling that, feeling the tail in on those delta curves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah no, I so, do. I do. It's basically like, okay, so I'll, I'll break it down for people who are looking at the chart. Yeah. Currently, we're at 398.46. Right. And then if you look, these are the delta hedging curves, the ones, the, the kind of rainbow colored bands over here. And there's kind of like a hollow until the delta hedging curve becomes like hits the um, uh, what would you call this? I guess the y axis, which is kind of in the center here of our histogram. Um, and that hollow kind of needs to get filled up, filled up before we could start to come back down. Is that is that a fair representation? That's it. So that dex is kind of leading where the deltas are going to end up being is yeah. what I think of it as. So like I said, again, it's like, well, into, it would be really hard for me to see us selling significantly into Wednesday, given the way the way that VIX is set up, the way the SPY is set up, uh, as far as GEX and DEX. It'd be very strange. So it'd have to be a, a, you know, some kind of tail event, which is possible given the way SKU is, but. Which, yeah, we'll get into shortly, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the way the positioning is already set up, I feel like the setup for the huge sell is going to be this super low skew and nobody's hedged. Yeah, yeah, that's when you're going. Okay, let's let's sell this thing. Off. Well, and this is this is part of it's these types of charts. So actually, it's funny because I don't usually read this off the decks. What I look at um, is I look at the net OI actually, um, and so I look down here and I see this clustering right here, right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you pay attention, the 390s are right here. Um, so it's kind of right at the top of where all that clustering starts. Um, and then if you go over to the net decks, you can see, okay, the 390s right here, and then you have you have some stuff above it. But really what this is, the net decks is just telling you, oh, these puts are hedged right, right here. Um, and that goes back to my point where if you start with the raw net OI chart, and then you add some clarity into, into it with your DEX and with your GEX. Well, now you have a really good idea of what the positioning really is. Yeah. Right. No, I, I totally agree. So basically what will happen for me is if we're at the right time in the expiration cycle and I'm looking at a net OI that looks like this, um, I'll be like, okay, I don't mind selling puts into this. Like we would have to have a real uh, mess of things happen to get under 380 here. Um, and then, you know, equivalently, I could just be looking at the decks and be like, oh, hey, look at all these positive deltas that are accumulated underneath us. You know, until we breach this level, those are all sort of static positive flows in a sense, right? Correct. Yeah. It, yeah. And those are, those are uh, you know, that's so that's basically how, we, how you'd want to look at it. So what's your risk here? Um, your risk of a cascading, cascading event is under the 390, which is, again, totally possible. I don't, I don't want to discount that as a possibility. And I would, I would welcome it. I think it's going to happen, but I think that the path there is complex. Like I said, we need to have a blow off at 410 first. We need to clear some of that inventory. Um, and I mean, a lot of this inventory on the on the, on the decks is there, right? Because it is all January 20th, right? Right. So if we get a blow off 410 for January 20th, we clear out all of this deck stuff. Then actually, we start to have that path down. Well, let's look at the skew. Yeah. Okay. We got to do that too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the skew. Uh, oh, why the hell did I, I got SPX or something? Pull, pull SPY up for the next, uh, just for like the next, I don't know if you can do it for just the next week or something, but I don't want to look at it for this many uh, expiries. So like I months. mean, I mean, the reason that, yeah, I can, I can grab it. Um, this is as of what was, today's the 16th. Okay, this will be uh, here we go. Um, okay, so this is not, I can't, we can't, we don't have an expiry sorting function for the SKUs yet. Um, oh, that looks, that looks better though. But yeah, so SPY is usually a little better. And then I can, I can, I'm pretty good at figuring out which line is which at this point, because I just kind of have an intuition for it. Um, 
So what are, you seeing, what are you seeing on this chart? Okay, okay, here's what's cool, and I haven't seen this in a while. Um, if you look at the, okay, so this guy, the, the, the really messy guy all the way up here, um, this is your zero DTE, because it's all screwed up, right? Um, in other words, like, walls were going a little crazy, um, you know, the smoothing didn't really work properly, we have these big the desk spread, because that's what happens at the close, basically, like, market makers just send out wide quotes just in case they're casting a wide net. Um, anyway, so disregard this upper line for that reason. So the next guy, January 17th, our four DTE is this skew right here, right at the bottom. You see where I'm putting my mouse kind of? Yeah. Okay. So um, if you notice, uh, this is like some, it's like more significant put skew than any of the other expiries, um, which just tells me all those puts that people bought, which we saw in the net OI that they're in, um, they have many vol points to go down. Because think about it like this. Okay, so these out of the monies right here, they're at a 20, uh, 20 vol, right? And VIX is at 18. Um, VIX is not going to, is, is unlikely to go up until after expiration. Um, and so the value of these puts or the implied vol of these puts is also actually going to decay um, mm -hmm. as we get into expiration. And it's going to just come down. And so that's actually going to force us up in terms of, uh, like, it's going to force price up. So the, the four DTE skew is saying, is is uh, supporting our thesis that we were seeing with the gamma, with the gex and everything that we're going to head up to 410. But okay, if you start to move out um, to the later expiries, which is this sort of red cluster in here, you can see that it's incrementally less uh, put skewed, right? Uh, it's like flatter. Call, right? Yeah, it's flatter. The calls are getting bid a little bit over here. And then if you look at the longer term. Um, it's way, way, way flat, which is actually, that's that's what I would call a scary skew. A scary skew. Uh, so if you look at skew a lot and you obviously look at this and you go, why is, basically what the market is doing is it's pricing in, it, it's basically, it's, it's what do they call it? Uh, platicurtic, platicurtic, because it's so flat. Platy Kirk Platic. Platocurtic, yeah. So they're they're basically there's like leptocurtic and then there's mesocurtic and platocurtic, which is with a flat version of it. And and they're pricing in uh you know a wide array of probabilities. Yes, for the the uh the longer term. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're in a situation where the market is already expecting something. That's the way I look at it as it's flat. Which means there's not a lot of um, there's not a not, nobody offsides really. If anybody's offsides, it's probably hedges. It's probably you know um, it's probably longs because they're not hedged properly. But um, you know the market is essentially expecting a you know a lot of different probabilities. They're they're what do they call it dispersion in the market right now? Yeah, and I mean the That's reason, I think the reason it that it's a scary skew from sort of a. Um... Like that, I, I almost tend to look at this as a as a bearish skew. It doesn't. It's not saying that we're going to go down. Oh, for it's, sure, it's bearish to me, but it's it, not. It's just it's not bearish in the sense that we are going to go down. That's what no. It, it's just saying that the vulnerability is there, and and the reason is right. So like this entire year, uh, or sorry, when I I refer to sort of like the not calendar year, but you know, let's say the last few months since Ukraine, all of that, right? We have been in a bearish situation. We're still in QT. Let, let me just, you know, we can all, I think, agree that the fundamentals are bearish. And so when you see a flat skew into a fundamentally bearish picture with a market overextended to the upside, that's not that's not a rosy situation. Yeah. So um, so looking at this, I would like, what does this go out to April? I would I would want to see like the March and April skews start to shrink in a little bit from those tails because mm -hmm. in my opinion it looks like the market is pricing in tails they're not pricing them that much because the vol is really low but given that it's so flat and so wide market is really uncertain and it's pricing in tails like there's no there's no opportunity for tail event here uh, it's you know that's basically what i'm looking at it as like where you were talking about the skew coming up Look at the difference between the, the skew you were talking about where we're, we're pricing inputs versus the way the skew looks for March and April. You know, yeah. It's very, 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 very different. That's what you'd want to see 
you'd want to see something like that to the uh, to the downside or upside, but you'd also want this to be sh to shrink in a little bit. And I think that's when you're going to start seeing the the tail events come in. And it's not going to be a tail event like it's going to be like a apocalypse. It's just going to be a, really it's just going to be a positioning event. I, I want to put a little bit of pressure on that idea that we're that we're um, that we are pricing in tails on the longer expiries because um, at least my interpretation of the fact that we have these sort of like longer lines, if that's what you're seeing, is that when we go into longer expiries, we have more strikes, and so we just have more skew, like more points, more implied vol points to add to the skew to make this line longer, so to speak. Unless that's sure, not, sure. What, not what you were talking no, about. No, 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 sure. Um, okay, so, no, that's that's good. So uh, as price moves up and down this line, what's going to end up happening? Uh, well, honestly, if price, like, if price were to continue moving up, I don't think that the skew could get that much flatter. It would just, overall, it would stay the same level of flatness, but it would just come down. So you'd go from having a 30 vol at the peak puts over here to having a 25 kind of, the entire complex would sort of move down. So, it, yeah, so it will, okay, so is it is it better to be a seller of premium in a skew like this or a buyer? Um, I mean, uh, let me think about it. Okay, okay, so let me, in order to answer that question, let me go through the second scenario. Like, let's say that price moves down, right? If price moves down, then this like let's talk about this April skew is going to start to look more like the four DTE skew, mm -hmm. where the put side is actually going to come up mm -hmm. and maybe start to hit the 35, 40 vol, um, and then the call side is just kind of kind of fall off a cliff here a little bit more, right. but not that not that much, right? So the put side is going to go up more than the call side is going to come down if we sure. go down. Um, so, in a if we have a bullish picture. I'm trying to think about what that means in, in, in the sense of what you should be buying. I think it's not a bad time to buy far out put protection. Um, uh, if you are, yeah, it's but not how far out though. Um, I mean, not as far as expiry goes, but I'm talking about out the money. Oh, how, how far down do you buy your puts? I think I, I would I would want to rely on these sort of historical vol lines to look at you know I I'd want to get something that's like H like a historical 30 day 60 day historical vol something like that so um, maybe I would go down to 375 for instance and then uh, out in March or something okay if, if if I were trying to get the best bang for my buck in terms so if you're of hedging right. yeah if I'm hedging correct yeah so why aren't people doing that then because it's clear. You know, it's clear that skew right now is cheap, like puts are cheap. Well, it, it, it is and it isn't, right? Because, okay, we have to remember that, like, let's say that all of a sudden the Fed does pivot, right? Um, and then we're looking at a 15 VIX again, right? Um, this is still, from the perspective of, like, from a historical perspective, having these this, like, a you know, 30 vol up here, a 20 vol down here, this is still pretty high um, for puts. And so the scenario, it's almost like people are afraid of, and I think this this accords with what you were saying about how we're pricing in a range of possibilities. We're kind of at this inflection point where people aren't sure, oh, should we start to get bullish again? Like, are we going to go up to, you know, uh, 4,500 type of bullish? Where like, like, that's literally what we're looking at right now. Or are we still in a bear market? Like, that's the inflection point that this skew is telling me that we're at. Okay. No, that's, that's fair enough. So if, uh, if... Again, we go back to, is it better to sell premium right now or to be long premium? And, you know, what, whether you're long calls or puts doesn't really matter that much. Um, you know, but would you be a seller here in, in general? I think, um, I think if you wanted to do the best of both, uh, would I? No, 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 no. I wouldn't get in front of this. Not right now. As far as um, selling premium? No, I, I would basically wait. Okay, because there's two scenarios, right? Like, let's say that we, um, if we beat uh, 410 and we stay above it, um, then you can definitely start selling again, right? Because uh, because then um, just the, the 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 and you're not even looking for as much implied ball compression there. You're mostly just looking to sell deltas. Um, 
but the thing is, if we're underneath 410 and we come, then we have a direct path, like you were seeing, all the way down to 390 at least. And then you'd have to see how the positioning would adjust. And maybe then you'd sell some premium. So if we, you know, it's funny because it's like if we look at a situation where the market is in this uh, flat skew, but it's still high, then the market is already expecting a wide range of probabilities. And it sort of seems like that's a mean reverting type of environment. Mm, I, I see what you're saying. Like, I see what you're driving at. So if we're in, if, if it's right, if this supposition is right, then it is better to actually be a net seller of premium. Sort of like what you were doing, you were selling premium into the end of the year and you took a little bit of heat, but not a lot. Why? because the market was already expecting that range. And so all that ended up happening was we tested the lower end and then we reverted back. Well, I, I mean, I kind of want to, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate because when I sold these things, the market was expecting us to dive off of a cliff um, in the sense that, right, the skew looked more like the four DTE skew where you have massive put skew. Not the March and April though. No, not the, but I wasn't selling March and Aprils. I sold Januarys. So if we're, we, we, I would say we're using the March and April as a, as an anchor point for the skew. Yeah. And so when your other skews get out of whack, that's kind of how you, that, that's kind of how I would, that's how I've been kind of gauging like, okay. Yeah. The I skew's think that's, gonna that's, sort of tend right. towards yeah. to try and look like these, these longer dated ones. Um, given that there's probably not a lot of positioning in those dates just yet either, but uh, you know, it's definitely a different look than what you saw. Like, I wish I could pull up a chart from like, say before summer 2022, um, it was a lot different look. And even after summer, they started looking a little bit different. And then maybe around like, I feel like the skew started looking like this, maybe around like September, October, you started seeing this flattening. Mm -hmm. And this always goes back to like, okay, so Jim Carson, he's always talking about how there's just this oversupply of fall, right? And it's never working for people. And so what is happening when people are, they're just not hedging like they used to, right? So this is what's happening to the skew is it's just getting, it's just getting destroyed because people are like, well, screw buying hedges. And at this point, everybody's getting rid of their hedges for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, you're seeing this skew drop down to whatever it is. I don't even know how you measure that. It's the zero percentile, but it's obviously been dropping and dropping and dropping as far as just the level of volatility that the entire skew is at. And then also the tails as well are dropping because, you know, folks aren't, folks are pricing I, I, it in, but they're not pricing it in with hedging. Vic, I, I agree with your read on the like sentiment related to the skew and all of these things. The reason I'm saying I wouldn't sell puts into this is because um, if you wanted to do anything, you would want to, you know, buy puts on the VIX, for instance. I mean, it's a little, uh, it's a little late now, but you know what I mean, right? Like you would want to, you'd want to trade the downside on implied vols all the way across the curve. Right. But if you're trading, if you're selling a put, you know, at 360 or 380 or whatever. Um, your risk for a tail event is actually higher um, when we're looking at this flat skew um, because you, you have the the risk that um, I agree you have a catalyst of some kind and then all of a sudden there's a ton of in the money puts and people can just keep adding I mean that's what we saw with the COVID crash right where it's like what ended up happening was that people that were in the puts would get in the money so fast and the movement was so strong that you'd actually just roll them down. And so I you agree. continually roll them. And so you don't get this buffering effect of vol and puts. Instead, you actually get an amplification effect. And that's what that is the main thing you want to avoid. I agree. Seller. I agree. So I agree with you on that. As far as if you were looking at the the March and April exp expiries, um, yeah, I would not be. <laughs> don't get me wrong there, because I would not be selling. I would not be, you know, short premium into those expiries. Personally, you, you may you may still get a, a reduction in the, the overall skew as far as the fall goes, uh, but I don't know if that risk reward is really worth it. Um, but I would say until then, these shorter skews, I think you should be 
I think it's it's a better risk reward to be a net seller. Oh, the shorter skews, yeah. Like everything, literally everything in January. Because yeah. look at, I mean, look at how you have some you have some pretty decent put skew. Um, and so long as you're selling underneath that 390 on spy, like we were talking about, especially if these skews that they if they if they pop up, uh, you know, above the historicals or you know, especially above the uh, like the IV 90, um, and then you should probably be you should probably be playing the mean reversion situation um yeah because so, i think that's what you're doing you're going okay look i'm ready to sell some in the money calls at this point uh, oh yeah yeah well because i feel i feel more comfortable doing that right now because it's like um be, i mean mostly mostly because of the january expiry the thing is i think that like that call is fair to make until the end of the week right so like okay let's sell some some 380s for friday okay no problem but what the hell is going to happen once we get the reshuffling after the monthly OPEX? Then we're going to have to come back to the SKU again and reevaluate the whole thing. Yeah. And so, and for anybody watching, I mean, this is just basically the process you have to go through. And uh, I would say, you know, it, it helps to find someone you can bounce ideas off of and uh, start to, you know, develop a full picture. You don't have to trade the picture that you develop, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, it definitely helps me to have the full context, at least have an idea of what the full picture looks like, you know. No, and today changed my views on some things because I was a lot more, I have to say, before I took a look at all these charts this weekend, I was a lot more bearish with regards to um, after this monthly OPEX and now looking at, at that delta hedging chart. It's not that I'm less bearish, but I do have a little bit of pause where I'm thinking, okay, let me reevaluate after that OI has reshuffled because it might not be this immediate sell that I was thinking it was going to be. And, and that's the other thing, too, is, is getting the timing right. Because uh, how many times have, have you been right, but you were early? You know what I mean? Like, you're right about things being bearish. Everybody is. I mean, things are not rosy. Uh, you know, th we're looking at, we're staring at a recession. We're probably looking at tons of job losses soon. The car market's about to crash. The housing market's in danger. You know, things aren't rosy, but you're most likely going to be early. You have to just be ready to accept that. And and it can go up. The market can be irrational for what? Longer than you can remain solvent. Right? You hear that all the time. And this happened to a buddy of mine. He actually was so, he was re extremely short. Like he was over leveraged short uh, February of 2020. For whatever reason, I don't remember what his, his main thesis was or whatever, but he was, he had to, he covered, he had to cover margin call wise, literally like a week before the crash. Oh my God. Because he was just early, right? So, you know, he didn't have all, you know, the tools that we had or I think he could understand them yet, but it's like, you know, if you have, if you at least have, a way to be like, okay, like you said, give me pause here a little bit because maybe I'm a little early, right? Maybe I need to wait for that VIXX to happen or maybe I need to wait for OPEX uh, because if you look at the the March 2020 uh, crash, it was, it was literally like Feb OPEX to March OPEX. Yep. That was the crash. It was like to the day. So... It, don't discount, you know, not for you, obviously you understand the importance. Don't discount anybody listening. Don't discount the importance of the expirations because everything that's happening right now is just, it's just a shuffling of positioning. Yeah. And I think, I think also something that, that I definitely tend to underestimate. And I think a lot of us underestimate, and this is something that, you know, Paul from uh, Paul Duncan from Gamma Edge has pointed out and he pointed out during our podcast with them is that a lot of this positioning is what I would call thick, right? It takes time and a lot of work to unwind it. It's not right. just like this, oh, you know, yeah. zero DTE, I'm going to just liquidate everything. Yeah. And I mean, that's why some of these effects, for instance, like this, the what I would call the gamma squeeze, or actually not a gamma squeeze, the delta squeeze or the put monetization that happened in big tech over the course of the last two or three weeks, um, they were like, at least with, let me use Microsoft as an example. There were a lot of people with in the money Microsoft 240s for January um end of january now the 20th mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um on those first few legs of you know you know we had like 
two percent up moves or whatever in Microsoft, it's not like they got all they all got out of them. A lot of them no. are bag holding those because those things yeah. are wound up with a lot of other positions as well. And yeah. now I'm finally starting to see some of these things come off, but it takes yeah. time. Um, yeah. and that's and why we look at the VIX the way that we do. It's because these hedges are representative of larger positions that are elsewhere. We might not even be seeing them. Maybe we're only looking yeah. at the tip of the iceberg, but you we're are looking at the looking important at the tip. tip. Yeah. You're looking at you're looking at essentially like the symptoms <laughs> of what's really going on under the surface, and uh, it's um, it's one of those things where it's you go back to the liquidity thing too. And I've I've been really trying to figure out how I can measure liquidity in the market um, because that's the main driver of all of this is how much liquidity there is. And 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 Jen talks about this all the time. There's 450 trillion dollars worth of assets. So if you just add everything up in the world and everybody's trying to hedge in SBX. Yeah. They're trying to <laughs> buy insurance on SBX for 450 trillion. So the notional value that you trade every day is like really like just a couple billion dollars of actual notional value that's moving the markets. So if you think of it in that sense where you've got 450 trillion and you're really only taking a, a very small fraction to move the markets every day. It takes a while for this stuff to happen because they can't come into the market and sell all their Apple shares. No, that they're, they're, they, they literally wouldn't be able to do it. Um, they couldn't. Yeah, there would be zero bid. So it, it uh, reminds me of the uh, FTX Alameda thing, right? Where it was like yeah. they were valuing their own currency at, at X, Y, or Z, and then, right. but the, the problem is that like they were the only buyers of their own currency. So the next day they're worth nothing, <laughs> right? Literally, that's that could happen to the market if you know. If it came down to where everybody had to rush to the exits at the same time, it it, it could be over like that, just in a split second, because that's how over leveraged the system is, and that's how much, that's how little poor insurance people can actually buy for for their assets, because everybody everybody's long the market, and it's just such a good way to think about it, because it's like if you own a house, you're long the market, because you want the house to go up. If you work, yeah. you're long the market, because you want wages to go up. I'm going to keep your job, so. You know, every everybody has an interest in the market going up, and the only way to protect yourself is to buy puts or you know buy some sort of hedge, and most of that is going to be in SPX because it's really the the biggest thickest market out there that you could do that with. So with that in mind, it's like the liquidity is the biggest issue, and and that goes back to your point where it just takes time to to get out of this stuff. They can't. You know, if they're buying hedges, they can't buy all the hedges that they want in one day. So that's why you track it every day. You know, look at it. Okay, well, look, they added here, they added here, they took away here, and then you got to make some pretty broad inferences on what's actually happening. But that's again where you look at you look at each aspect, uh, you know, as neutral and unbiased as you can, and just make a make a judgment call based on the evidence. We're looking at the evidence here. I mean, the only thing we can really say is that we're at least flat to bullish into Wednesday. <laughs> this is what we're pretty sure about. And we have some pretty good reference levels. You know, yeah, like and we'll, and, and after after Wednesday and in particular after Friday, we do expect a moderate pullback. I think that's fair to say. Uh, yeah. Something over 390. And then, um, you know, but. You know, after Friday, that 390 level could change. So then we'll reassess the 390. And see yeah, because you got to think about these deltas. They're, you know, they're expiring too. They don't need these deltas. No, that's what I was going to say. These are yeah. all Jan, Jan 20th deltas. So that's that's where I, I I could see a little bit of um explosiveness come into play. But I mean, we still have all this uh all these puts. Like if you get to 390, all of a sudden all these put strikes out here in February. I mean, still we have time until February, so you could have like maybe a couple weeks of even coming further down. Um, but at that point, these 380s start to catch us, right? Um, yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, some great stuff here. And uh, hopefully people learn a few tricks to just help themselves out. If, or or you can basically go, you know, screw all this. I just want to learn how to trade a moving average crossover. Because <laughs> uh, this could definitely throw you off. Um, but I would say I would say the key for me has been just combining the GEX, OI, the DEX, and the SKU. And then looking at the VIX, so you got like a five, you know, got five things to look at. If you just wrap your head around those five things, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the market's going to do um, on a time basis and a volatility basis. Okay, 
because it's all about you know it's all about the time volatility and the positioning and uh if you can at least wrap your head around you know get an idea of what's you know what could occur and why um it'll definitely help you out so yeah, yeah and I think, i'm, I'm I think, excited to see what this all looks like uh, i think Vic, since, since we have pretty well nailed down okay you know what are the different parts of the system you know i've done a podcast on skew i mean i'm sure i could do more but i've done like the fundamentals of skew podcast we can mm -hmm. add a fundamentals of dex fundamentals of gex yeah. um, and then just have the whatever what did you call it like the three horsemen or whatever um, <laughs> i don't know why four I horsemen? That, but yeah the three or four horsemen of, of something man i was trying to come up with some kind of moniker for something but uh yeah, I mean, uh, it's really the five the five pillars here of uh, of kind of getting a 360 view. <laughs> they're gonna be like they're gonna be like, can't you guys need to get one number straight? Like <laughs> I know, right? I know. <laughs> if I was uh, if I was like trying to create a course or something for people, I would probably you know obviously nail some of this down. But um, I'm way too lazy for that because I really just want to trade. Um, and uh, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I know for like my experience, at least was I learned the most from listening to podcasts like this, where it's like, you know, you have to do a little work to sort through the stuff. But also it's people just being honest because they're not filtering everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. And, and my whole goal, man, whenever I started my YouTube was uh, was really I just wanted to uh, just give people ideas on, you know, let people know how I'm doing, how I'm trading stuff. You know, you don't have to do it like me, you know, just like, like you have a totally different style than I do. And it's you know it's an infinite game so you can trade however you want to uh really as long as you as long as you develop yourself an edge uh, of some sort this right here is edge you know this is stuff that you know 99 percent of folks are not looking at so right there if you if you have any kind of understanding here then you already have an edge that that most people don't i mean the big banks probably all look at it but you know it's like I've I've talked to institutional guys. They have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm looking at this stuff. They're trading, yeah, they're it's, trading it's, it's amazing. RSI and VWAP strategies, and it's like, well, that stuff is like like classic cookie cutter retail stuff, you know? Well, and even even the quants that do, and I was I was talking to Jazz from um, uh, he has that tool uh, in NFA. What do they call it? I think uh, I think it's just called Gexbot, honestly. Um, and uh, Anyhow, I was I was talking to him and 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 we were we were mentioning how um, even a lot of the quant guys, what happens is they they have a tendency to assert that there's no edge, right? Like that as a retail trader, you can't get any edge. But I think that a lot of times that happens because they're what they're exposed to is they're seeing how quickly their transactions happen, how how their software is sort of seamless in this kind of beautiful way, how they're trading many markets at once. But the part that they don't see, because they're so involved in that, or because you know, as market makers, you have your algorithms that's you know they're pricing all their forward balls and you're correcting to make sure that your forward balls are all in line and whatever. What you're not seeing is this sort of like, what is the big picture of the gamma world? Because you don't need to see it because your edges come from somewhere else. You don't care. Yep. yep. No. Um, no, dude. No, there's you know if they say retail doesn't have an edge, that's ridiculous because. I can go into Ninja Trader right now uh, and create edge with one moving average. I can back test the moving average, and it's, there's instantly an edge there. It's not a it might not be a great edge, but I can I can promise you I could find a profitable strategy with a single moving average, you know. And so if that's possible, then there's edge everywhere. There's literally unlimited edge. Yeah, it's just it's yeah, just I kind of a, it it's, I mean it's. Yeah, it just ends up being complicated once you start to factor in, uh, you know, and maybe this D edges the edge, but like transaction <laughs> costs sure. and uh, time invested and all these other things, you know. Um, Retail is an advantage because you can be in and out as much as you want. Like if you get a big bank and they've got 10,000 lots of, of E-mini, you know, it's going to take a while for them to figure out how to get out of that position. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And whereas you and I, you know, we're trading one single lots you know so we're in and out as much as we want we can literally take the best trades every single day without having to think about it they can't because they move the market so they're you know, their edge is that they've got tons of capital and they can just sit there and take a loss forever and then yeah. eventually come back uh yeah if they were using their capital to sell the puts that i sell then uh they'd be doing pretty well and that would change the market though too so then you would see you would see that reflected 
<laughs> so they yeah, 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 yeah. They have they to kinda, deal with the stupid reflexivity issues and yeah, all sorts yeah, of things. Exactly. Processes. So there are a lot of other issues that come come with uh, you know being a big bank. Yeah, they can cheat, you know, and they can uh, front run you, or they could, you know, you know, put out news or get political to that you know helps their positions. It's like, but none of that, you know, that's edge that they have. That's not the same. You know, we don't even care about that. You know, I, all I care about is making 200 bucks a day. I don't need to mess around with, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have to, I don't have to kill nobody to get paid. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I just got to come in there and figure out how to make five points, 10 points. <laughs>